Hello, thank you for joining. We will just wait one more minute before we get started. All right, I suggest let's get started. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, depends on where you are on this planet, um, for joining um, our webinar about financial forecasting with DataIQ. And we have a special guest today. I think, Jesus, you can go to the next um, slide already. Um, I am Marie, I'm from DataIQ, and I'm doing this webinar with Jesus from GTI. Hello, Jesus. Hello, Marie. Hello, so, everybody. perfect. Let's get started straight away. Um, and I just want to start with a short introduction about DataIQ and what we do before Jesus will deep dive into a use case that GTI Japan Tobacco International has been developed um, on the financial uh, forecast um, topic. Um, so as a short introduction, DataIQ is one of the fastest growing data science platforms on earth. And as you can see on the slide on the left hand side, we do have a deep presence today across the Fortune 500 and basically every industry um, worldwide. So you can see that DataIQ is used today in pharmaceuticals, but also in many financial services organizations, manufacturers and beyond. What we are trying to do is basically driving, um, let's say, or, or enabling both data scientists and citizen data scientists to drive a better economy, economy of insights while delivering net new AI capabilities. Our success as a company and our effectiveness as a technology is increasingly being recognized by the analyst, analyst, analyst commun community, sorry about that. And um, in that um, sense, Gartner, for example, has recently named us a leader in their magic quadrant. What are actually the um, top challenges or one of the challenges that, um, that we see are faced by the financial teams today? For, for that, Jesus, I ask you kindly to go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, per se, I think we can all agree that data is nothing new for financial teams in organizations, as they always obviously have been handling data and, and they know how to, how to work with the data. That being said, financial teams are actually crucial for the operations of an organization, as they are essential value generators in, for example, modelizing financial outcomes, liquidity, or cash flows. So financial forecastings in organizations and, for example, budget planning um, are um, important in organizations. They actually touch many, let's say, lives of employees on a daily basis, but they still remain an incredible challenge. What are the challenges um, that we see that um, financial teams face in their daily, uh, let's say, work? First of all, um, we want to go from a siloed to a business driven approach. And in order to, to manage this shift, we need to combine different data sources, such as, for example, historical data, financial records from accounts, sales. And we need to um, add to that external data, such as, for example, economic indicators. Secondly, um, the data sets are increasingly getting bigger and bigger, and therefore it is very time consuming to build models, to build accurate forecasts, and the, these, all of these tasks, tasks actually require a lot of manual uh, work. Another challenge that we see 
is how to be agile. So how can we, for example, quickly adapt um, to the changing circumstances to always have an updated model? Or how can we shift from a statical approach to more, let's say, soft predictions, shifting from monthly forecasts to perhaps forecasts on a weekly basis? Another topic uh, or challenge might be about reinforcing risk management. So how can we reinforce the risk management? How can we adapt to often changing regulations? How can we reinforce uh, key controls such as AML, KYC, et cetera, et cetera? How can we identify risk signals? How we can uh, steer new risks, for example, in form of climate change, new market trends? And how can we be compliant and robust at the same time? So how can we um, make sure that we, we build these compliant projects and how can we then go to production in a secured docu and documented environment? And while, doing all, and while addressing all of these challenges, we usually, as a finance team, always also are in charge of or must reduce costs and we need to gain efficiency, for example, to um, build projects around cash allocation. And for all of these tasks, AI actually has a key um, role to play. And um, Jesus, please go to the next slide. Um, so AI can, a, can play a, a, a key role, actually, when it comes to facilitating and um, accelerating how we leverage data. So AI can, for example, help us to enhance the impact of human expertise and intelligence to help us gaining efficiency along the value chain. AI can also help us in transforming manual processes into, for example, automated forecasts. And this ultimately will then result in cost, in cost reduction, for example, as the forecast accuracy also can um, actually be improved. And obviously, AI can also play a role when it comes to adjusting to a new world, to constantly adapting to new risks, new demands and new players um, on the market. So essentially, what AI can help us to do is to turn data that we might see um, sometimes as a burden into a very valuable asset in organizations. Go to the next slide, please. Um, what we see at DataIQ is that we, in order to embrace this AI potential, we actually need to keep the balance between working on short-term impact um, projects and to work on these um, let's say, strategic uh, um, projects that will actually um, initiate a long-term transformation. So if we look at the um, blue um, bubble, you can see that these are the projects with a low level of maturity and with, with also a low level of complexity. So here, these are the projects that require lower technicity. So these projects can ideally be developed by empowered business teams, which are supported by data scientists. And we can help these teams to gradually build up their skills. These projects um, will answer most likely short term needs. So these are ad hoc analyses that we can do. That being said, there is still a high impact potential in these projects, for example, to lower costs and to reduce incidents. And we can work on these um, projects through actually a broad range of approaches. So it's about pr um, perhaps prioritizing alerts. We can build smart analytics and we can build dashboards. On the other end of the spectrum, so here in this pink or red bubble, it's um, it's about reinventing basically um, the business processes with advanced AI. And you can see that these are the complex and more mature projects that we will work on in organizations. So here we really think about the advanced, highly innovative use cases that are handled by the advanced data science teams. And these projects will take longer to develop, but they are also going to have a longer term impact. And again, um, we really believe at DataQ, it is about keeping this balance between short-term impact and working also at the same time on these more complex, more strategic, I want to say, use cases. Next slide, please. Um, and this is exactly where DataIQ as a platform steps in because DataIQ enables all the different teams to collaborate on one single interface. So. Essentially, this means that clickers and coders um, can work together, and this will actually allow us to, um, to get the business IT and the data experts closer together and actually really work jointly on these different projects. 
All of this can be done in a transparent and documented manner. And given that you can follow up basically on every single step that has been done, DataIQ is, audit race, is basically audit ready and allows you to be compliant with the different regulations um, that your organization needs, needs to be compliant with. Um, besides that, DataIQ really is built to um, support you on the journey basically from idea generation to actually fully operationalize your AI projects. And this means that you can really start with the data aggregation, you can prepare the data, do some feature engineering, build a model, and then also um, industrialize these data pipelines that you have built to actually um, make sure that the projects that you're working on will generate value in a quite, let's say, uh, efficient way for your organization. And with that, I let Jesus take over, share his use case um, at Japan Tobacco International. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending. Uh, let me start with a short introduction to, to JTI uh, for the ones that don't know us. Um, so. JTI is the, the Japan Tobacco Group's international tobacco business. We are we were founded in, in 1999, and now we are one of the biggest tobacco companies in, in the world with more than uh, 45,000 employees all around the world, uh, plenty of factories, research centers, uh, tobacco processing facilities, and selling our, our brands in over 130 countries. Um, so you can imagine that the many and huge efforts we have to do about planning and uh, forecasting uh, in a single year. Okay, so I'm showing, uh, and by the way, most of those efforts are so far being done mostly manually. Uh, so I'm showing here one of the the cases we we developed to help our forecasters and, and make their lives easier by using uh, data science and application. So it's about cash flow forecasting. Um, the case is, is as following. Uh, on a monthly basis, our, our entities, different markets, have to forecast the, the cash flows of the next 12 months. It's a 12-month rolling forecast for different categories, such as uh, finished goods, excess duty, or whatever, in and out flows. Okay? Um, this has to be done every month. Uh, so forecasters have to, to manually gather all the information from different data sources, analyze it, compare it with the previous year, do whatever they have to do, to finally produce um, the forecast and upload everything uh, manually to the system. Uh, so in total, it takes around 400 hours a monthly. And um, the accuracy is, is was around 30%. Sorry, not accuracy, the error. We're making uh, different categories. and lags was around 30 percent um so this this first two kpis is uh, of course good indicators to identify the potential and to prioritize the different uh, incoming demand we we had we saw that um this uh, this is a, a extremely manual process uh so we're spending lots of hours and the accuracy we have in the forecast is is, is not extraordinary so there's we saw there was potential to um to introduce ai to improve accuracy Okay, so with that in mind, uh, the goal of the project is to, is to, to improve this 12-month rolling uh, um, accuracy and, of course, reducing the time taken to, to produce the forecast. The idea is, is not to, to replace our, our human forecasters, not at all. We, we believe they are the key in this process. They, they have a lot of, of knowledge, uh, but we want them to concentrate in the task in which they, they can really add value. And, and, don't, don't let them uh, spend their time in, in tedious tasks and that uh, can be done uh, automatically. So um, uh, that's the idea. How we, how we develop the project is simple. We did a very simple project using agile methodologies. So first thing is uh, why we use agile. Um, I think there are two uh, elements here that uh, are really um, useful for, for data science or artificial intelligence projects. Somehow, data science and artificial intelligence uh, have a component of, of research. You, it, it is difficult to plan every single task you have to do uh, during the project before starting, because some some uh, some of those tasks uh, depend on the on the results of the previous tasks of the previous experiment you ran. 
So um, Agile is very good to deal with uh, with uncertainty. Uh, in this way, uh, at the end of each sprint, you analyze the results you get, and then you decide in which direction you want to, to continue developing. That's one reason. The other reason is um, trying to keep focus on, on delivering uh, a product at the end of each sprint. That means a, a model up and running at the end of each sprint. Uh, it's also very important, uh, I think. Mm, that allows us to, to mm, fail fast and also to, to have results from the very beginning we can analyze and again drive the direction of the, of the development. So with, with that in mind, we, we applied this, this uh, methodology in a quite short project, four, three weeks sprint. And um, this is kind of the schema we use for also for other projects. So the first sprint is always, uh, we, we always use it for checking uh, data quality, um, reduce the scope if, if needed, and, and again, delivering the baseline models. Um, simple models, but uh, we have something to start analyzing, to start work, uh, and, and start improving on, on top of it. After that, um, again, you have to decide what to try here and there. Uh, in this case, we tried with uh, some internal data sources, and um, we failed fast. Uh, and one of the advantages of, of Agile, we didn't spend uh, two months in analyzing one particular data source. We just um, did something fast and, and found that there was no, no, no potential to um, try developing in another direction. And we keep uh, improving the baseline models with different techniques. Um, then the next spring, we try with the same factors, adding some, some macroeconomic indicators or tobacco industry indicators. Again, we didn't find any, any accuracy improvements. So we, uh, very quickly um, move in another direction and keep improving the model with, with other techniques. And uh, finally, we added an extra data source for which we, we found uh, some potential, like uh, spent uh, are already invoiced but not paid. So uh, it helped us to, to forecast the, the cost in the coming uh, one, two months. And finalized the model. Um, so, um, here the message is agile methodologies really, really help here to uh, adapt to this uncertainty and fail fast if, if possible. Um, one extra thing I'm showing here is at the end of, of this sprint, we, we usually spend a couple of weeks more to um, build the final product and, and make it usable by the final user. Here that idea is very useful, you know, uh, with a couple of clicks you can deploy the model and um, make it usable by the by the final model uh, by the final user and not only that we also um, develop very quickly uh, some monitoring uh, tools to keep an eye uh, every month on how the model is performing against the, the, the manual forecast and of course against the, the actual so that's uh, the idea how we how we develop this um, again very simple and agile methodologies really really help here with that, uh, this is a summary of the results we, we got. Um, I'm showing only uh, distance zero, zero, that means uh, the, uh, the forecast for the coming months and distance 11, that's 11 months, 11 months uh, away in time. Uh, the error reduction was uh, quite significant in all cases, uh, so forecasting uh, some, some millions of dollars better forecasting. And of course, reducing the time to we spent to produce that. We reduce it in, in around 80%. So now our forecasters don't have to do everything manually. They just simply get um, the forecasts produced by, um, by our, our algorithms, and they just have to review. They have to check and amend and correct the things that they think are wrong, uh, but they can focus on the task they really uh, add value. Okay. So with all this, um, by the way, we, we were awarded with the best uh, project of 2020 by the European Association, Association of Corporate Treasurers. And uh, so they really like the approach and the idea of um, start applying artificial intelligence uh, to, to finance forecasting in a very simple way without uh, being a very, very big project. Uh, they really like in a, in a quick um, and simple way, we got very good results. So this is uh, basically the project and um, the lessons learned, the messages I want you to take away. First one, uh, keep it simple. 
uh, usually data scientists, uh, you know, we are a uh, geek. We try, we, we try, we like to use the, the, the latest technique, the fanciest model. Um, it should not, I think it should not the, 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 be the first thing you try. Um, again, uh, with, with agile methodologies in mind and with, and with the idea of, of um, delivering a product even in the first sprint, uh, I suggest you to start with, uh, with the simplest, well-known approach. And uh, surprisingly or not, in, in most occasions, you realize that uh, this simple approach already beats the Vanguard forecast uh, without much effort. So uh, here with an um, Arima and a couple of, of tweaks, we got over 20% per, 20 error reduction. So if you have time later, of course, it's, it's nice to try the, the, the latest techniques. And probably you get some extra QSE equipment, but uh, start with the simplest and probably you will get already some, some good results. Second thing, um, check for data quality. Um, before that, of course, check for, for data access. Data access is always um, a pain. So what we usually do is even before the, the starting the project, we spend a couple of weeks to uh, gather a sample of the data of the different data sources we want to use uh, during the project and uh, analyze it. Analyze it, and the best way to, to analyze is to uh, start modeling it. Just simple modeling, not, not just having a look and check that there are no big values. If you, if you uh, try to go a, a bit deeper, um, you will probably find some issues. So it's, uh, the, the sooner you find these issues, uh, the better. So check for data access, of course, but also for data quality, if you can before starting the project. Then um, monitor not only, not only how good your model is. Uh, remember that you might have a, a model uh, performing very well and 90% accuracy, but if nobody's using it, your model is, your model is useless. Okay, so um, monitor also adoption rates. Monitor, uh, keep an eye on, on if your users are using, are really using the, the, the models, uh, facilitate the jobs. And in order to, to uh, get uh, these adoption rates, my suggestion is to try to involve the final users from the very beginning of the project. Uh, for example, in this case, the, the request of the project came from the, so to say, the headquarters. But the, the users, the forecasters, are in the different markets, in the different entities. So it's important to try to involve them also uh, from the very beginning so they understand what, um, what was done and how it was all. Okay, so, so they use it. And the, in line with, us, with this last uh, suggestion, uh, keep um, educating people. Keep improving the data culture in your in your company. Explain what's going on behind the, 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 the scenes. Uh, not just provide the forecast and say, "Hey, this is what you what you have." Um, try to to make people understand uh, so they they trust the machines, they trust the algorithms, and and, and know also where it's, should they focus uh, to, to uh, improve the, what what the the algorithms uh, give. So this is uh, more or less it on my side. We already have five minutes for your questions, so I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Marie, do you want to take over for the questions? Marie? Okay, so I'm going to ask the first question. Don't hesitate. There's a chat room dedicated for the questions. So do fire away for Jesus. Uh, he's here for you to ask all the questions that you may need. Um, so the first question that I had was, who are the internal stakeholders supporting this project from the business side and from the IT side, Jesus? So for the, for the business side, this is our treasury group. Uh, they every month they collect the, the forecast from the entities, um, and they were the ones uh, approaching us to suggest this this project. But of course, the, the final users again are the forecasters in the in the entities. So I would consider them as key stakeholders. And, and as I mentioned, they should be both in the, in the project. On the IT side, um, well, uh, our finance uh, IT team was involved, and then they they. Um, collaborate with, with us, with the data science team, 
to, to deliver this. Okay, thank you. And another question is, which models did you use? Well, we, we tried uh, different models and then you choose the, the, the best performing ones. Uh, sometimes, actually, we automatically select one or the other depending on, on the different categories and how they are behaving in the past. So we started with, with uh, seasonal arima and exponential smoothing. I would say the, the classical approach, the first thing you should try when, you, when it comes to time series forecasting. And then we, we did some sampling. Uh, but again, we, we decide these this extra steps depending on the results we got. So if at the end of the first spring we analyze and we find that for a certain category we are getting um, very bad performance, we analyze and we realize, hey, here you need some uh, outlier detection because there are plenty of outliers in this category. Or maybe ensembling with this uh, regression model, you will get some extra accuracy. Uh, but again, uh, starting with an ARIMA or exponential smoothing is, I would say, the standard approach. And with with they with them, we we already did the manuals uh, in the first group. Okay, great, thank you. So thanks for all the questions. The questions keep coming in. There's another one. Could you give some details on the data sources you used, SAP, Excel spreadsheets, and so on? Yep. So the, the actual comes come from, from our SAP system, SAP PW. Uh, so every month we get the, the actuals and uh, also we get the manual forecast to, to uh, compare with our models and monitor. Then, as I mentioned, we, we tried some other internal data sources, but we failed. We also tried some external data sources like microeconomic indicator, tobacco industry indicator, and um, we didn't find we didn't find great uh, improvements in accuracy. And uh, the extra that as we use is about uh, the, the invoices we, we have in the system. So some things we, we, we know we have to pay in the coming months, of course, so it helps the forecast, but all, only for the for the coming or the next two months, not for, for, for the 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, very simple thing, very simple also for the data sources. And uh, we try some others, but uh, try to fail fast. If needed. Okay. Um, another question: Can you give us a few examples of the KPIs on how you convince the users to adapt the ML outputs? Well, the, the, the two main uh, KPIs are uh, accuracy. Uh, we, we tell them. Uh, I just saw here a couple of examples that we did uh, for the AI dashboard where they can play with uh, with the results and uh, with the manual forecast they did and the, and the, the forecast from the model, so they can really compare. And uh, they can also find in which categories uh, the manual forecast is better, for example. So they, uh, this, this tool was really useful for them to, to understand what was going on and when to use the, the, the model forecast and when to use the manual or when to correct the model forecast with, with their insights. Um, so again, showing the results, which were obviously better. Uh, educating, trying to uh, let them understand um, how these algorithms work, a couple of simple workshops with them. Uh, so they don't think this is uh, black magic. They, they understand that it's going on. And um, some tools that let them um, analyze the results, compare, and decide. Because they, they, they need to feel empowered. And then they, they, they are the final uh, responsible for the forecast. So they, they need to, to feel that they, they have that power and they can decide when to use the model forecast or the final forecast. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Another question about the internal stakeholders, I guess. What role played did uh, regulations and compliance play, and how did it fit in in your project organization? Did you work with regulations and compliance at all? Not in this project, uh, to be honest. Um, we are we are working uh, on some other situation, but not not in this project. Okay. And how do you manage data? Do you use any version control for data? We do have uh, our data lake uh, in place, up and running. So it's, it's our main tool for uh, data governance, so to say, data uh, legacy and these things. Um, so yes, we, we, we use data lake and we, we get the data from there. OK. Uh, a last question is, did you fail including other data sources, and why? Did we fail? You mean? Yeah. Yes. Well, we we uh, tried uh, 
uh, to include them, uh, but we, we didn't find any, any accuracy improvement. Again, we tried with some internal data sources. We tried even checking the relationship between um, the categories we were trying to forecast. For example, uh, if you buy a lot of leaf this month, maybe you are producing lots of finished goods in the coming three months. Uh, so the, the, the amount of leaf you buy in this month could be a good indicator for the uh, finished goods you are selling uh, in the next month, but we couldn't find any relationship. Uh, we also try with external data sources like uh, Bloomberg with uh, microeconomic indicators for the different markets or uh, tobacco industry indicators. And again, here we found a couple of problems. First is granularity. Sometimes uh, these data sources are, have uh, yearly data and we are working uh, on a monthly basis, so it's very difficult to include them. Uh, or if they have quarterly data and you have uh, monthly data. So for one reason or the other, we, we, we failed to, to include. Uh, but we failed fast. That's a, the, the good news. We didn't spend mm -hmm. two months in, in trying to incorporate the data source. We just uh, did a couple of simple experiments and uh, rejected that option. OK, thank you. We're going to end with one last question. Is it right that there was no use of AI at all, but you used time series regression techniques to keep transparency and explainability? Uh, yes, we actually uh, tried some other techniques. Uh, we had some time to try uh, uh, some extra, uh, yeah, more advanced techniques. Uh, but indeed, we didn't get um, a big impact in terms of accuracy. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, they could be more difficult to explain to the final users. So we, we are sticking to, to these classical techniques, uh, easy to understand. Yes, explainability is also something to take into account mm -hmm. when you um, delivering when you want to uh, increase your adoption rates. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jesus, for answering these questions. Uh, it's great to see the enthusiasm of the public because we got some comments as well in the questions uh, room about the presentation being very insightful. So I'm very happy that also the audience found it uh, insightful and interesting. Um, I think we're at the end of the webinar. So thank you, Jesus, uh, from JTI for uh, giving us um, your insights on how to do financial forecasting with data science. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, thank you for also, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you uh, also, Marie, for, for presenting also what DSS can do in financial forecasting. You can find uh, the replay of the webinar if you missed certain points, or if you want to listen to it again. Thank you for your participation and see you soon on one of our Data IQ webinars. Have a great day or great evening, everybody. <laughs>